nothing is gained. But everything is possible. And what was won that day on the Normandy beaches was our liberty of today. Nous sommes rassemblés en ce lieu pour célébrer la gloire des soldats du 6 juin, parmi lesquels ces vétérans que je salue, venus de si loin rejoindre leur passé, eux qui ont fait. He's now welcoming the veterans who have come away, come from so far. Mais l'hommage to meet again their past. Pour avoir porté le coup décisif n'est pas séparable de celui que l'on doit à ceux qui l'ont rendu possible. He wants to thank them. It's praising now Britain, which for a time stood alone against the German tyranny. A reference. He talked about à la pointe de l'action great organization of the abilities of the Americans les Hollandais, les Norvégiens, les Grecs, les Polonais, and he named les Czechs, the allies les Slovaques, les all of those who march past today dans les armées alliées. all who fought voluntarily in the Ce allied armies du peuple russe qui and also the heroic Russian people he said must not be forgotten Ce furent les fronts d'Italie, d'Afrique du Pacifique, ce furent les résistants des pays occupés, ce furent les forces de la France libre et de notre résistance intérieure mobilisée pour l'honneur et pour Everybody la patrie. Everybody resisted, and it was the French resistance, he said, here, organized in France, that helped to win that freedom. Les opposants allemands, auxquels il ne restait dans la nuit qu'était devenu leur jour, Qu'un seul point de repère, l'Allemagne dont il rêvait, où s'était exprimée la plus haute culture, d'où s'étaient répandues les plus hautes pensées. Tirons-en la leçon. Let us take a lesson from these events. Pour nous-mêmes, and for ourselves, sauvée, Europe saved, ne peut être qu'une autre Europe. Could only be another Europe. 340 million Europeans, 340 million Europeans autres, waiting for more. Se sont dotés de lois communes. Un conflit armé the gift of common laws est devenu entre eux inconcevable. Réconciliés, les adversaires de la bataille de Normandie marchent désormais du même pas. Puis de même s'apaiser les déchirements qui près de nous dans l'ancienne Yougoslavie, plus loin de nous en Afrique noire et dans combien d'endroits du monde. Yes, he says the president. Let's now, as we are reconciled with our enemies, remember that other countries too are suffering. Other countries too have to fight for their freedom. Pour la paix des pays du monde, des peuples sous l'égide de nos Nations Unies, nés elles-mêmes de notre victoire. Cela exigera encore beaucoup de courage, peut-être de patience. They might need courage oui. and obviously patience. Let's go. Allons-y. So, he et quotes again General Eisenhower. De la France, les peuples et les, et leurs soldats qui ont contribué à la libération de mon pays. À vous qui les représentez. Now he's thanking those who fought for the liberty of his country. And I speak for everyone, he says, every Frenchman. I thank you for the liberty of the world. And there, in a moving speech, the president, an ancient fighter in the resistance, François Mitterrand, speaks for his whole nation and possibly the whole of Europe as he ends this ceremony here at Omaha Beach. This is a somewhat abridged version in English of President Mitterrand. Back to you, John. Who can and tremendous... President uh, Mitterrand, uh, summing it all up with typical Gallic uh, fervor and passion um, and making a typical tribute towards the Germans and reminding people about the Franco, new Franco-German alliance. In between watching that, 
and uh, listening to that. We've also been enjoying the build-up to the British event down here in Aramanche. There have been a lot of uh, toings and froings, many comings actually, on the beach of the veterans and the bands. So let's go over and hear all about that to Raymond Baxter. And here on the beach at Aramanche, elements of today's scene are being set in place on this historic stage. The atmosphere is palpable, you can feel it. It seems to radiate back from that wet sand. And here you see the assembly of the veterans of Normandy marching onto the beach and see how they march. And if you were the tribe marching on wet sand, I can assure you it's not nearly as easy as they make it look. In the center, their banners and standards, the old comrades associations, the regimental associations, indeed the service associations. In the center, the bands to which they march with such precision. The band of Her Majesty's Royal Marine Commandos and the Royal Artillery. And they're the symbol of what today is all about. The landing craft L4003 Arakan, the British Army tank landing craft from the 17th Port and Maritime Royal Logistic Corps. The very corps which designed and built the Mulberry Harbour, the relics of which you see in the background, providing the back cloth itself to this remarkable scene. The veterans form a huge hollow square. We know that a few minutes ago, 110 coaches had arrived, 120 were still unloading. 7,000 people at least on the beach, men and women, all here in their own right. For never forget that amongst the Normandy veterans are many ladies who served as nurses or drivers, or Navy girls, or indeed with the Salvation Army. The regimental bonnets and berets and caps. The medals ranging throughout the gamut of gallantry. And the marshals, the soldiers of today, the men of the Royal Logistic Corps, whose enormous responsibility it is to get this show organized. And, of course, it is a great rendezvous of old mates, many of whom may not have seen each other for many years. Much to talk about, much to rejoice about. And there is the Academy Sergeant Major of the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, the most senior NCO in the British Army, and he will command this parade in the presence of his sovereign. This is Gold Beach. Along the coast from us here, there were Sword and Juno as well. And it was at Juno Beach that Captain Stanley Gill, as he brought men ashore, Canadians from the Royal Winnipeg Regiment, won his military cross which he wears now. What's it like being back above these beaches? It's wonderful to see, brings back memories, and makes me think that it was all worthwhile to see how things have been put together again. Have you been back since? Not since D-Day 1944. Can you give us any idea of what it felt like to be there then? We didn't have very much time to think. We just got on and did what we had to do. And you are all of what age? 72. And then you were 22 when you won the Mercury Cross? Yes. And it was presented to you by? General Montgomery. Or at least the ribbon in the field. And you won that for doing extraordinary things, but you didn't come you didn't intend to be a professional men-at-arms at all, did you? Well, we'd been training to do this job for some years, and um, we got on and did it as best we could. You make it all seem 
terribly matter of fact? <laughs> well, it, um, you, you act and do things when you realize it, what is necessary to be done. You get on with it. Captain Gill, thank you very much indeed. Our congratulations and our thanks to you. From Juno, Sword and Gold Beach, goodbye. Back to John. And as Raymond Baxter said, so much to talk about. Uh, we thought that we should consider some of the other things apart from the sheer fighting. Uh, that was involved, because apart from the effort that the Allies put into intelligence and deceiving the Germans, as uh, we were talking about earlier, deceiving the Germans about Allied intentions, a great deal of effort was put into assessing the obstacles the Germans were planting along the Atlantic Wall and devising appropriately ingenious weapons in return. Uh, Vivian White has been looking at what were collectively called Hobart's Funnies. In the first wave of the assault, Ahead of the landing craft were what looked like flimsy canvas coracles. To the German defenders, these crude, fragile craft were easily overlooked. Amongst the more familiar, she, as a Jewess, was sent to Auschwitz. She went to Belsen after that, and she heard about the liberation in Auschwitz. They never believed. They hoped against hope the liberation would happen. In the end, as more rumors arrived from more deportees, she walked in her concentration camp and saw an upturned copy of a German newspaper which mentioned the word Kottentau on the Normandy beach. She knew then the real liberation had happened, though she never believed that she had survived. With her, the mayor of this town, to the left of your picture now, Monsieur Le Comte, will be making his speech before Her Majesty. And the royal party are now going down from the seawall towards the beach, towards Gold Beach, to begin to review the veterans. But in reality, to pay tribute to them. Although Prince of Wales as the heir to the throne, and to majesty of those to whom these veterans will constitutionally pay tribute. In fact, the tribute is to them. The salute is to them, and they, the veterans, will be saluting those who are not here. And the close association of the royal family with Her Majesty's armed forces is not only delineated by the uniform which they wear. It is a very close personal thing. And they are now going to perform what was described in the overall plans as a bomb burst. They scatter out into the open square of veterans, which as you see, is still forming up. Still they march onto the beach even after the royal party has arrived. And that gives you an idea of the chaos and confusion on the roads behind this little town, where all the world has suddenly concentrated on this little strip of Normandy. At the last count, 230 busfuls of veterans determined to parade in front of their sovereign. If D-Day was about logistics, so is this commemoration. John. It certainly was about logistics because successful military campaigns depend on two things at least, the men and the firepower and the morale naturally, and then they're critically reliant on that unbroken stream of supplies and ammunition. However great the actual military fighting aspect of the campaign was, the logistics and supplies behind it were equally important. Mike Joe, this is the sort of thing which civilians always tend to... meant to be here in the town that recognizes him still. It absolutely amazes me to think that I've come back here 50 years after I first landed on the beach along the coast. And I'm delighted to be here. And of course, I shall be thinking of all the brave men I left behind who always stayed here. But they stay in our memory. 
Thank you very much. And here on the beach, the members of the royal family continue their visit to the veterans of Normandy. There you see the Duke of York picking out uh, fellow sailors, no doubt, but well qualified to talk to any ex-service man because of his own personal experience and the many offices which he holds. Yesterday we saw him at the airborne occasion at Vanville as Colonel-in-Chief of the Canadian Airborne Forces. Her Royal Highness Princess Margaret, I once met a veteran who had had the privilege of meeting Princess Margaret who said she knew more about my regimental history than I did, and I thought I was a bit of an expert. And that's the kind of conversation which is taking place down there. The young Princess Margaret with Elizabeth, a few weeks before the invasion, with the king in conditions of great secrecy, went to see a display of gliding and parachuting, one of the last rehearsals before the invasion of Europe in 1944. They were privy to the great secret. Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal, not in uniform, although amongst her many offices, is that of an honorary air commodore in the Royal Air Force. But here again is a lady who knows her military history and is prepared to chat on their own ground with knowledge and experience to these veterans, whatever their background may be. Princess Margaret, frankly, in her element even on a wet beach. <laughs> and here's Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, military uniform today. What an incredible schedule he has been following in the last 48 hours. And there you see the crimson coats of the Chelsea pensioners, for they, of course, are here too, and they, of course, will march too. And in the background, you hear the music as yet two more bands march on. The band of the Army Air Corps in the pale blue berets, and the military music, which has been playing for, what, an hour now, I should think, has provided delight, not only for the veterans, but of course for the thousands and thousands of spectators, official and unofficial. The inhabitants of Aramanche and those watching this parade have been perhaps almost astonished to see what the British set upon their beach here this year in 1994, as some of the Germans were, as the fog cleared, to see the force that they'd marshal here, ready to liberate and take the beaches of Normandy. And Her Majesty the Queen, in this helicopter of the Queen's flight, is coming now from Aramanche east towards our gold beach to her troops of whom she is commander in chief to review them and to see them parade in front of her thousand upon thousand of them seven thousand we expect altogether to marshal upon this beach now There he is, Brigadier Sir Alexander Stania. And that was the man who, as Lieutenant Colonel David Nelson Smith, from the 1st Battalion, the Hampshires, came ashore here leading the 1st Battalion of the landings, was wounded, 
and is remembered for his bravery here in the museum here at Aramash. He's been leading this parade. He retired as a brigadier. He's remembered here as colonel. The Hampshires and the county from which they came are familiar here. There's a ruder Southampton around here as if it was just a local street name. Proudly, at the head of the men whom he first led ashore 50 years ago. We spoke to him today about leading this parade. This was our final objective, and in spite of terrific heavy casualties at Le Hamel, uh, 180 killed and wounded, uh, we got here dead on time, 8 o'clock the day evening, uh, without, in fact, this place being very heavily guarded. And uh, it was a complete success, but at a great, great cost. Tell me why you are going to be leading the parade today? Well, that's a good question. Um, I put it up to the MOD about two or three months ago uh, because uh, we captured the place, we were the liberators, and I felt um, we should be uh, given pride of place. And there you see him. The Liberator. There's a young man wounded as he came ashore. And to the strains, the bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover, the men who sailed away a hundred miles. to land in these Normandy waters and wade ashore. And as 10 years ago, the members of the Military Vehicles Appreciation and Restoration Society are much in evidence. Here you see uh, the weapons of war of 50 years ago in full good running order and the pride and joy of their owners. And arriving now upon this gold beach, politicians of all parties including the Secretary of State for Defence, come here to pay their tribute and their respects. Margaret Beckett, the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party. Labour. And here on Gold Beach, they're rolling out the barrel, as they've every right to do 50 years on. going down onto the beach not to review the veterans 
but to take up their places in the enclosure reserved for them. It is simply extraordinary to think that the men whom you see there parading and marching and waiting to be reviewed by their sovereign to parade in front of her jumped to shore with heavy packs upon their backs on these beaches 50 years ago. It was difficult enough just to walk ashore. They didn't build this place for landings. It was a bucket and spade beach upon which these men landed. Well, I have to say they didn't all do that because amongst them there are seaborne warriors from the Royal Navy, the Green Beret there of the Royal Marines, and there are representatives of the Royal Air Force there. And the air arm was one of the most significant keys to the success. Overlord could not have happened had not air superiority been won. There's Paddy Ashton arriving, leading the Liberal Democrats. The IPs take their places. Soon Her Majesty will be here. They're all waiting for Her Majesty. And behind them, there you see Aramanche, its population, the widows, the wives, the families, the veterans themselves. Minister with General Mike Jackson, the commander of 3rd Division, 3rd UK Division, and they were the men, 3rd UK, who 50 years ago came ashore here. It's his div which have organized all this. They greet the mayor of Aramanche and Simon Dale. them, the UK has come to sing. The Navy laid a barrage, the Air Force cleared the air, England was a hundred miles away. Before long, you'll see arriving here, upon this beach, turned to a huge parade ground, Her Majesty, 
call come in her range rather brought down a ramp onto this beach to review her veterans take her place upon the dais and she then parade in front of her the landing craft symbolizing all that happened here there were men who came ashore there were tanks that were floated ashore with extraordinary devices that you saw earlier in that film to get them ashore safe and sound to astonish the enemy when they arrived. Astonishing their crews almost as much, I suppose. Men of 19 commanding DD tanks, chugging them ashore on these beaches before their astonished defenders. offshore the vessels of the Royal Navy as they were 50 years ago. That is HMS Edinburgh D-97, a Type 42 destroyer, the White Ensign streaming proudly from her stern, and she will fire a 42-gun salute when the Queen arrives. And other ships out there, HMS Avenger, a Type 21 frigate, HMS Fearless L-10, the assault ship, which brought the landing craft to offshore where they were offloaded to come onto the beach bearing the veteran standards sailed over from Portsmouth. And in this gray atmosphere, a pale gray-green sea, the camouflage of the warships is itself as evocative as the pictures we have seen of D-Day itself, except then, of course, that horizon was obscured by smoke. Many sailors saw so little of the shore because of the smoke and of the gunfire and the smoke screens that they couldn't really understand what was going on three miles away from them on the coast of France. And there are other warships out there too. Vest Deep from the Belgian Navy, a frigate. From France, the Duguay Trouillon, a missile armed destroyer. From the Netherlands, the Abram van der Hulst. And from Norway, the frigate Bergen. And from Poland, number 832 Krakow, an assault ship, a symbolic recognition of the allied element which fought off Aramanche and the other beaches. And the royal family are now taking their seats because soon Her Majesty will be arriving here. In a few moments, York and we all We'll hear these sea shanties turn to the national anthem. Overlooking this beach turned to a parade ground now, at present, two flags fly, two national flags. Above our marsh and the sea wall. And this extraordinary sight. Standards will be brought ashore.
the Academy Sergeant Major David Cox, very much all attention as he confronts the parade and issues the executive orders essential prior to the arrival of Her Majesty. I was told by some of the young officers who've passed through his hands at Santos recently that he's a kindly man, and I, I looked them hard in the eye. They then went on to explain to me that he had fear on tap. And the Academy Sergeant Major is approaching the veteran standard bearers just in front of the ramp of the landing craft. And now we shall see marched ashore the national standard of the Royal British Legion, borne by Mr. Ray Thomas, formerly of the Coldstream Guards, and the national standard of the Normandy Veterans Association, born by Rowley Jefferson, BEM, formerly of the 8th Battalion, the Rifle Brigade, part of the famous 11th Armoured Div. The march, what could be more appropriate? Aramanche. Escort to the standards, warrant officer days. The Royal Standard has been broken out. Within moments, everything will shake with the 42-gun salute from HMS Edinburgh as she moves right to left in front of this parade ground. A few kilometers back from here in Crepon this morning, they had a tryout, and we heard them very nicely. And now all is expectation for our first glimpse of Her Majesty. The parade still standing at ease. The Sergeant Major will draw them to attention, of course, as soon as Her Majesty approaches the ramp down which she will drive. And there, Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh arrive on this historic occasion at Aramanche.
Her Majesty the Queen reviews her troops. Brigadier Nelson Smith salutes her, the head of the parade. Her Majesty, as Princess Elizabeth, was 18 in 1944 when all this happened. The salute continues from Edinburgh. We promised you'd hear quite clearly. This is a very, very special review. It's hard to see who is showing most respect for who. She clearly greatly admires these veterans who liberated these beaches as they salute her. Have you ever seen a military parade anything like this? With soldiers, not just saluting, but cheering and applauding their majesty. Queen at Aramash on the Normandy beaches. And the applause and the cheering rolls around the perimeter of this open square and through the crowded stands. And so Her Majesty dismounts in readiness to mount the royal dais immediately behind her, from which she will speak. Now coming up to the dais, with the Duke of Edinburgh and Her Majesty, Simon Vale, in Auschwitz 50 years ago, and the Mayor of Aramanche, as Academy Sergeant Major Cox, goes towards His Majesty, the Commander-in-Chief. Ask permission for his veterans to be stood at ease. Granted. Standard Order! Standard! Right! Standard! East! Stand! Easy! Your, Your Majesty, Majesty the veterans, veterans, ladies and gentlemen, 
à remancher en votre nom, en l'honneur des vétérans, je m'exprimerai en anglais. Welcome to France. Welcome to Normandy. Welcome to Haromanche. We all wanted this 6th of June to be exceptional, unforgettable, and colorful. It's the D-Day for remembering, for emotion, and for giving thanks. This long-awaited day for which we have prepared so hard over many months is a day when our hearts will beat strongly, a day when our eyes will be damp with tears. Normandy is where memories come together. The whole population rejoices to welcome you, you the soldier of the longest day, you the soldiers of liberty. I can't, I can't express, express your majesty how pleased and proud we are that you have chosen Haromanche as a place where we can all render homage at the great number of veterans gathered here. Veterans, you trod this Normandy sand 50 years ago. We are on the very spot of your magnificent conquest. Our wish to celebrate this anniversary together, today, joyfully, doesn't take away for a moment the memory of the darkest hours of June 1944. What a terrible sacrifice the people of Britain made to liberate Europe. And what tears were shed by Normandy left, wounded and scarred. We must keep these pages of the book of history. So, our young generation on whom the future of our democracy rests, will not forget that peace is worth all this, and that your sacrifice were made for our freedom. Monsieur Le Maire, thank you for the welcome which you and the citizens of Aramanche have extended to Prince Philip, to me, and to all our countrymen. I am glad that the government of France is represented here by Madame Simone Veil, by the courage which she and a multitude like her displayed in the Nazi concentration camps. She represents perfectly why we are here today, to remember, <laughs> to remember, and
and to give thanks for deliverance. This town and this beach must hold a unique place in the memories of those of you who were here in June 1944. I am proud to see so many veterans of Operation Overlord, one of the most remarkable amphibious operations ever accomplished. You and the widows of those who fought will be remembering the deeds that were done that day. The comrades and husbands who never returned and those who did come home, but sadly are no longer with us. D-Day was indeed the beginning of the end. The months of planning at home, of preparation by the French resistance, all conducted in the utmost secrecy, culminated here in Normandy that day, beginning the liberation first of France and finally of Europe. Many of you will have in your minds vivid pictures, perhaps some all too vivid, of that epic day and of the heroism and endurance shown by our own troops and by our allies. Those of us who were far away can only imagine what it was like and stand back in admiration of those who planned and fought for the establishment of that hard-won bridgehead. It was you and your comrades and allies fighting on other fronts who delivered Europe from that yoke of organized barbarism from which the men and women of following generations have been mercifully free. They should remember that they owe that freedom to those who fought and defeated Nazism. Next year, we shall commemorate the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Old adversaries are now reconciled. But the Europe which we know today could not exist had not the tide of war been turned here in Normandy 50 years ago. Veterans of the Normandy campaign, you deserve your nation's thanks. May we, your fellow countrymen, be worthy of what you did for us. And the words of Academy Sergeant Major Cox, Your Majesty, may I have your leave for the veterans of Normandy to march past and disperse, ma'am, please. by Colonel David Nelson Smith. 
as he was then when he came ashore here and was wounded. Majesty, in her speech, has paid tribute to these men. The mayor of Aramanche put it in plain old-fashioned military terms. He talked of rendering homage to them. Watching their bearing and their march, it's hard to remember that every man and woman marching past Her Majesty is, shall we say, of a certain age. They march in divisions of 10 by 50. in line by the markers third div who 50 years ago were on these beaches As we watch this splendid company now marching from the beach, it's appropriate to realize that for every veteran here today, there are scores who are not. And I'm not thinking only of the fallen who were honored so movingly at the war grave ceremonies this morning. I mean, those many of whom may be watching at this moment, and one I know has said he will lay out his medals on the television set. Those who, for one reason or another, were unable to make the trip, perhaps because they left it too late, don't have the means to get here, or indeed those, and there are many, who do not choose to demonstrate publicly their involvement in the war. I met an old friend a couple of weeks ago, ironically enough, at a memorial service, who until recently was the director of one of our leading charities, having retired from the Royal Navy as a captain. And he told me that on D-Day as a junior officer, he commanded a rocket-firing landing craft running in towards this very beach. The craft next to his struck a mine and blew up, and it was commanded by his best friend. On shore, a German pillbox equipped with a flamethrower had been located, and my friend was told to go in close and take it out with his rockets. So he said, we did that, and I thought it was rather good, really, but all I got was a mention. Still, I'd like to have gone back for the commemoration if I'd got round to it in time. And another old friend who would have liked to have been here is a retired fisherman from Leon C. Essex. He came out on D-Day in a Royal Navy trawler loaded with 40 tons of diesel. Their destination was Omaha and later here. Their job to refuel landing craft offshore, a sort of floating mobile filling station, pumping the fuel out by hand and of course under fire. But his abiding memory as an experienced young seaman is of sympathy for the American soldiers going past towards the beach. Poor boys, he said, they were so seasick it was pathetic, really. Well, they didn't know, did they? Now, those two stories are a fitting reminder, perhaps, of the sailors' role on D-Day and also of the total integration of the Allied effort 
British trawler refueling American landing craft off an American beach. And now the familiar fish formation of the RAF's Battle of Britain Memorial flight. The Lancaster city of Lincoln with the Spitfire and Hurricane in company. Today they commemorate not only the Battle of Britain without which victory in 1940, Operation Overlord would not have taken place four years later, but also the part played by the Royal Air Force on D-Day, during which 5,369 operational sorties were flown in the 24 hours. Now they hold position in order to come over and to salute the veterans. And this whole occasion and the allied nature of it strikes a particularly personal note for me. My wife, then my fiance, went ashore at Omaha as an American army nurse, not on D-Day, of course, but not very much later. And let us not forget, it is only after the shooting has stopped that casualties become mere statistics. No less brave than the fighting men themselves were those who tended the wounded, and many of them are in this parade. Of course, and by no means by accident, the tunes to which they march are those which they whistled and sang.
ladies of the British Ex-Service War Widows Association, wearing on their right breast their late husband's decorations. People of our marsh look gratefully upon the British soldiers and sage sailors and airmen who 50 years ago came to make this behind this tribune the place du Sichuan. who broke through Hitler's Atlantic Wall, who opened up Fortress Europe. and indeed the bagpipes have been much in evidence around Normandy during these past few days. Royal Air Force Battle of Britain Memorial Flight in salute. They represent the bombers, the glider tugs, and the transports which dropped the palace, the fighters which kept the Luftwaffe at bay, and that successor to the hurricane, the Hawker Typhoon, which provided such devastating close support. The crowd cheers, but above all, they represent the 8,000 British and Commonwealth aircrew who were lost during the Battle of Normandy, and the 12,000 RAF aircrew and 2,000 aircraft lost in the two months of intense operations prior to D-Day.
So the hollow square begins to dissolve, but there is still yet one flank to march. and Simon Dell, whom Her Majesty said perfectly represented the reason why all this was worth doing. Normandy legions. Before the war, a holiday beach, and after the war again, the Duke of Edinburgh. Salutes and admires these men. The very sand upon which they march now was crucial. In the months before this invasion took place, brave men came here in midget submarines to take miniature samples of the sand. It was crucial to know exactly was the, how was the land upon which there was a land. In the UK, people were asked, a delighted commander-in-chief. In the UK, people were asked, to send holiday snaps, anything, so they'd know everything about these beaches. Every clue was vital. So Academy Sergeant Major Cox, Mr. Cox, has done his stuff. Divisions. 50 by 10, the bands between them. The band of the Royal Marine Commandos march off to their march past, the march past of the, Her Majesty's Corps of Royal Marines, and now, as each band marches off, we shall hear its regimental march past.
was General Mike Jackson. Third division can be pleased with the parade they organized today. Mark you, they'd be the first to tell you it was all about the veterans for whom they organized it. They were plain, but it was the veterans this was for. Everybody was. Above this beach, Gold Beach at Ara Marsh. There are three flags flying. The tricolour, the royal standard, and the union flag. The Prime Minister applauds them. So as Her Majesty leaves the days, this historic beach, until so few minutes ago, the focus of a thousand pairs of eyes, a thousand, thousand, a million pair of eyes, including you people on television, watching on television. Now it is empty as the wavelets come in on the rising tide. Next of all, Her Majesty will be escorted from Gold Beach by General Sir Mike Jackson, commander of 3 UK Division. Up above the seawall, where those who couldn't parade, but have attended this parade, nonetheless, there awaiting her. Behind her now, applauding her, the population of Aramash, who gave up their places on the Tribune to stand on the sand and watch all this. And Lance Corporal Darren Walker Pipes, Her Majesty, up from the beach. Learned his piping before he joined the Colours. 200 years ago, one of his ancestors, he tells me, was a piper as well in the army. But he's not just a ceremonial soldier. As a gunner, he was aboard a Challenger in the Gulf War.
And on the Tribune, Her Majesty greets veterans who come here to see this all happen. They and their families and widows of men who couldn't be here and their families, all here in the Tribune in the town square of Armash called the Place du Sichuan. Every street name, every place name here speaks of what the men led by the 1st Battalion, the Hampshire Regiment, did 50 years ago here. Their own regiment is commemorated as a Place de la Libération, as indeed there is in every little town here along this front. To get some idea of the scale of what they did, it takes about an hour and a half now to drive the length of gold, sword, Juno, Omaha, Utah. Small towns like these, where battles were fought in the dawn hours of D-Day, This town was taken in the evening. Prince Philip, evidently delighted by all he's seen. And Her Majesty is going to meet next, besides the families, those two disabled to march here. And also there are French veterans in this company, not only from the resistance, but also from the French armed forces that fought the Free French. About 50 here, 20 of them were members of the Gaullist Groupe Lorraine, commanded by the great General Fouquet. And there will also be 10 French veterans who are Compagnons de la Libération. De Gaulle only conferred this honor on 1,036 men altogether. A distinction indeed. Behind Her Majesty Simone Dale, whose sister in Belson, in the closing months of the war, cradled their mother as she died. And now, Her Majesty meets a line of veterans sat proudly watching this from their wheelchairs. They had the best seats in the house above the seawall. And after the parade, their chairs were turned round so they could greet and salute her and she greet and salute them.
They all said here, the old soldiers, that this wasn't to be a celebration, but a commemoration. Nevertheless, it's been a triumph. The very idea of turning this beach into one giant parade ground, extraordinary, extraordinary. And the success self-evident. You saw earlier Prince Charles, whose reaction to all this spoke for us all. Lance Corporal, Walker, pipes her majesty through. A small town in Normandy. Her Majesty, in 1944, when all this happened, was 18, much the same age as a lot of the men here who fought their way ashore at Aramanche and all along these beaches. Prince Charles, whom you saw, moved by all he saw. A lot of these men, as young men lied about their age to come over here and fight, adding a couple of years or so on, so they could fight for their country and come to liberate this country and begin to break through Fortress Europe. They came from the sea where later the British brought a whole port with the size of Dover. They waded, they swam, there was a barrage ahead of them, there were planes over before them. And they walked and fought into Normandy. 50 years ago to the day. And rather than just have a parade anywhere to symbolize this, they came ashore on the very beaches where now they parade. It was an inspiration to use the French phrase, a coup de théâtre, to do this here. Monsieur le maire, age 43, a child of liberation, wearing his tricolor. There you see him just to the right of your picture. The local GP, this little town of 425. Some of the men here have come back frequently year after year. Ten years ago, there was a parade through the streets here at Iron Marsh. But a lot of them have never been back before today. But today they knew they must come if they could. It's been a good day. And today, no doubt, Her Majesty will recall those events of 10 years ago, the 40th anniversary here at Aramanche, 
a much more simple affair, equally moving, not so much music, the aircraft flew over. On that occasion, through various circumstances, Her Majesty was late arriving. She couldn't have been late arriving today because the tide now is coming up the beach. The landing craft is virtually ashore and soon the footprints in the sand will be washed away by the rising tide. We all know from the programs which have been published the incredibly demanding schedule which Her Majesty and members of the royal family have been obliged to pursue during the last three days now. And yet it is self-evident that the Queen herself is reluctant to leave this gathering. Her Majesty, of course, finding special time for the wheelchair-bound veterans. But again, it's, uh, it's a time of happiness. Look at the expressions.
and Her Majesty now approaches the end of the town square, it is to be precise, where you see flying in the stiffish breeze and it's stiffening the royal standard, the tricolour and the union flag. And there, there will be performed the traditional ceremonial of sunset as the flags are lowered. And there you see the four trumpeters of the Royal Air Force College, Cranwell, who will sound the music of sunset. Aircraft uh, overhead returning from the ceremonial at Omaha and providing an extra bit of spectacle here at Arromanche. The band, the musicians stand in readiness for the sunset ceremony. And the fanfare trumpeters are in position too. They wait the cue of the director of music, which will be given when Her Majesty approaches that flight of steps on the seafront. Musicians of the regimental band, the Paras, led by Sergeant Wilson, provide the last, final musical accompaniment to this extraordinary parade before the sunset ceremony.
As Her Majesty leaves our marsh, the ceremony is over. For my generation, the post-war generation, the war was the extraordinary thing that our parents did, and which they don't often talk about. And D-Day, a feat of arms and logistics and bravery on such a scale, seems incredible. But in ordinary places like our marsh, here along the Normandy beaches, before my generation were born, extraordinary things were done. An army landed from the sea to begin to end a war, an army manned by the ordinary brave young men of their generation. Our generation, you find it hard to believe ourselves, will pass on to our children their true story. And with the Queen's departure, so ends the ceremonial commemoration of a day 50 years ago. There are those who will tell you that this will never happen again. Well, on the scale, perhaps not. But at the Menin Gate in Flanders, the last post is sounded yet in honor of those who fell in the First World War. Every year since 1920 on Anzac Day, the children of the village of Harefield in Middlesex lay flowers on the graves of Australians and New Zealanders of both world wars. Next year, on this day, there will be those who will return to Aramanche, to Merville, Ranville, and the Pegasus Bridge, and other places dear to them in memory. The numbers of those who were there then will decline, for the tide of time is as relentless as the sea itself. But the memory and the honor to those who made these things happen 50 years ago may not and never will be forgotten, for they are written indelibly into the history of the modern world. The ingathering of the veterans, the march past that became a sing-song with no loss of dignity. Well, understandably, we've been concentrating on the main international and British events in Normandy this afternoon, but the French haven't overlooked those countries whose actual contribution may have been smaller in substance, but was and is valued because of what it represented. Over the last few days, the length of the Normandy coast has been marked by celebrations for the other nations who have a right to be remembered as being among the liberators of France. One of the most famous events, of course, was the American attack around saint mer Eglise. This is a memory of the extraordinary story of the parachutist who was caught on the spire of the church, and he hung there for hours. He pretended to be dead. He wasn't actually dead. The Germans thought he was. One of the great images of this particular period, the French Prime Minister, Edouard Balladur, in saint mer Eglise signing the Book of Remembrance there. The French Prime Minister has been much in evidence uh, over the last couple of days, also at the international event. There he was joined by Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands for a march past of veterans at Port Odemer, just along the coast from here. And uh, that was actually yesterday, where you can see that the sun was rather... Uh, the sun was out, the weather was a good deal better, but we've been very lucky today that the weather has, for the most part, held off, it's got better and better, and now the sun has broken through. And also, the Canadian veterans, uh, they marched past in Caen today. Uh, the Canadian Prime Minister, Jean Chrétien, he was present for that march past, and also there he's been greeted by President uh, Mitron, and he had also naturally been at the memorial service for the Canadian dead at Courseul. And in fact, the Canadian contribution on D-Day itself was very significant. 20,000 men were put ashore. A third of the size of the British contingent, contingent landed on Juneau Beach, and they rapidly fought their way through saint Aubin. That was where they held their commemoration a bit earlier today. The Canadian assault on Juneau Beach started at 0735 hours on June the 6th. It was the task of the 3rd Canadian Division to secure the assault area and advance inland to the railway line between Caen and Bayeux. The Canadian and British troops, having struggled through heavy seas to land on the notoriously narrow beach, found St. Aubin and neighbouring bernier sur mer thick with enemy fire, and it wasn't secured until 10.30. The captain of our uh, landing craft 
was a lieutenant in the Royal Navy and he had been in four other landings. This would be his fifth landing. He says, I'm going to get you in there high and dry. As we were getting real close to shore, the Jerry's must have spotted us and mortars were landing just to the side of the ship and everybody running looking to see the mortars exploding. And of course, as they exploded, the explosion went underwater, so there was no damage at all. He drove her onto the beach, and it was fine. There was hardly any water there. Then we let down the ramp to unload the vehicles. As the ramp went down, it hit one of the mines, which the engineers that had landed around midnight that night had failed to find and failed to clear. And that uh, mine blew a big part of the ramp up, which would normally not allow any vehicles to disembark. But the way our craft was loaded, the last vehicle on was a tank. That vehicle unloaded, pushed down the ramp. The rest of the vehicles were able to uh, disembark with no trouble at all. About that much water, nobody even got their feet wet. The commander of the ship, we were up on the bridge, uh, got the order to move off, and uh, we heard him say, Jerry, we're bloody coming. <laughs> he told us and promised us that we would have a dry landing, and he drove that craft right up onto the beach. As the craft hit the beach, there was a explosion, and presumably it was a small mine, and they couldn't get the ramp down. So here we are in this craft on a rising tide, and we're just sitting there, and anyone that wanted to shoot at us could jolly well shoot at us. We were sitting there for an eternity, but which probably was only 20 or 30 minutes. And then the ramp came down, they finally got it down, we onto the beach, over to the to the hole in the wall, up onto the road, and into Bernier sur Mer. Coming to the Americans, yeah. President Clinton, of course, has also been much in evidence in recent days. He has been honoring the American war dead, first of all in Italy, then in uh, Great Britain. And today he began his tribute to the achievement of the Americans and those who fell by talking to veterans of one of their most bitter engagements, that at Pointe du Hoc. The arrival of the presidential helicopter marked the beginning of the American commemorative events. The site Pointe du Hoc, a headland between the two American beaches, Utah and Omaha. It was here where men of the 2nd and 5th range of battalions silenced the German coastal battery. A veteran indicates to President Clinton the 100-foot cliff face they had to scale to achieve their objectives. Ranger Len Lummel, who found and destroyed the Pointe du Hoc guns, accompanied President Clinton, along with Linda Williams and Anne Edmond, daughters of Colonel James E. Rudder, the man who commanded the 2nd Ranger Battalion during the assault on Pointe du Hoc. Of the 225 Rangers involved in the assault, 135 lost their lives here, marked by the Ranger Memorial, where the President laid a wreath. That was followed by a 21-gun salute from the 2nd Battalion of the 75th Ranger Rifle Squad. Many of the surviving rangers made their way back to Pointe de Hoc 50 years after they first landed here to be saluted by their president. 50 years ago at this place, a miracle of liberation began. On that morning, democracy's forces landed to end the enslavement of Europe. Around 7 a.m., Lieutenant Colonel James Earl Rudder, 2nd Ranger Battalion, United States Army led 224 men onto the beaches below and up these unforgiving cliffs. Bullets and grenades came down upon them, but by a few minutes after seven, here, exactly here, the first rangers stood. We commit ourselves, as you did, to keep that lamp 
burning for those who will follow. You completed your mission here, but the mission of freedom goes on. The battle continues. The longest day is not yet over. God bless you, and God bless America. The visit to Pointe du Hoc, the first of many opportunities for the president to meet with veterans of the American assault on Normandy. After speaking with some of the men who'd made the long journey to the northern coast of France, a shorter journey west for President Clinton to the site of Utah Beach, where men of the U.S. 4th Infantry Division had landed at 6.30 on the morning of June the 6th, 1944. President Mitterrand of France joined President Clinton in laying a wreath each to commemorate the comparatively small loss of 200 out of over 23,000 troops at Utah. A minute's silence was then observed in remembrance of those who died. The Wren Military District Army Band then led a march past of the colours. As a traditional farewell is followed by a uniquely American moment from the chorus of the 82nd Airborne Division. This is the Army, Mr. Green. We like the barracks nice and clean. You've had a housemaid to clean your floor, but she won't help you out anymore. Reporter Rob Curling. D-Day, of course, was only the beginning, but because it succeeded on the day, because the basic plan remained intact, victory, though delayed, was never really in doubt. Let's look at the way a landing turned into a campaign and ultimately enabled the destruction of the power of Nazi Germany. Colonel Mike Dewar has been with me in the studio all weekend, but he now takes up the rest of the story in the Normandy countryside. Montgomery's priority was to form a continuous front from the two American and three British beachheads. Fortunes had been mixed, ranging from near disaster on Omaha Beach, where the Americans struggled to hold on to a toehold, perhaps half a mile in depth, to relative success on the three British beaches, where Canadian and British troops had managed to drive up to eight miles inland by midnight on D-Day. It was to take until the 9th of June before a continuous front could be formed. Progress for the British on the left flank was painfully slow. This was partly due to the difficult terrain, but mainly to the fact that the Germans had committed the bulk of their panzer reserves to the defence of Caen, being keenly aware of its strategic importance. Caen was eventually captured by the British on the 9th of July. Then Operation Goodwood was launched from this area on the 18th and 19th of July in an attempt to break out southwards. This too was frustrated by the Germans, but it did have the effect of drawing attention away from the Americans and what they were doing on the right flank. It was roughly where I am standing, just south of Saint Lô, that the US Army launched Operation Cobra on the 25th of July. It was to take them first to Avranche on the Atlantic coast, but more importantly, it was the beginning of that great movement south and east akin to a swinging gate with a hinge at Caen, which was to propel the Allied armies deep into Normandy. Combined with the slow but steady pressure being applied by the British Second Army moving southwards from Caen, the remnants of 20 German divisions were being squeezed into a pocket just south of Falaise in central Normandy. The final act of the Battle of Normandy was about to be played out. Here, five miles south of Falaise, in the middle of the so-called Falaise pocket, 20 German divisions were caught in a pincer movement by the British Second Army advancing from the north and the first and third American armies advancing from the west and from the south. When the two arms of the pincer movement met here on the 20th of August, after three weeks of really hard fighting, 
140,000 German soldiers had been killed, were wounded, or were missing. It was a huge military disaster for the Germans, and it was the turning point for the Allies. The Battle of Normandy was over. Now the task was the pursuit of the retreating German army to the Seine and Paris, 110 miles up that road. And it took just five days. Ike Dewar and I'm joined finally by Charles Wheeler and General Sir Martin Farndale. What if the landings had failed? What if D-Day had failed, General? It's almost unthinkable after what we've seen today. But if the Allies had been driven back, I think the end of the war was still in sight. But it could have taken over a year to remount this. It couldn't have come back to these beaches. But more significantly, of course, the Russian armies would have been advancing. They'd have got through Berlin, they might have got to the Rhine. But I think, hidden in the background, we now know the nuclear weapon would be available. And who knows what decisions might have been made then. That's a pretty apocalyptic scenario, Charles Wheeler. It's the ultimate iffy question, isn't it? I don't think anybody, let me just say this briefly, I don't think anybody involved in that operation ever for a second thought it would fail, oddly enough. Mm. People at my sort of level, at my kind of age, 21, mm. never thought of that. Um, if it had, we'd have been driven back in the sea, we'd have lost all our landing craft, we'd have lost most of our weapons, because you couldn't have got the weapons off again. And we would have and lost And I don't think that. we would have been able to mount a major combined operation. And we would have lost that time because the Russians, who suddenly switched from being allies to being a political threat, would have continued advancing. I mean, that is, that's almost not iffy. One can't be absolutely certain, but it's pretty, pretty sure, isn't it, General? They'd have good, uh, Germany had to be reoccupied by somebody. And if the Russians were advancing, they'd have had to keep going, even in the interests of the Allies, they'd have had to keep going. I think, you know, I, Churchill always wanted to go into the Balkans. Uh, the Americans wanted to go into the south of France. I think it's conceivable that one yeah. might have been able to reinforce the Italian campaign, come in from the south, and somehow regain some kind of initiative. But certainly, I don't think there would have been another cross-channel invasion, because the, 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 the material simply would not have been there and could not have been made. In so, time. despite we were right, we've yeah. been right to mark D-Day as a historical event in this way, General? Absolutely. The most significant event in the war. Perhaps just as a final moment, though, we should not forget that there were those fighting significant battles in the Far East at this time. The turning point of the war at Kohima and Ko Imphal was going on at the time. I'm sure those will be remembered in due course. Thank you both very much. So, in the last two and a half days, the achievements of the D-Day landings have been recalled. The veterans have been honored, their dead comrades commemorated. The events of history have been brought into a sharp contemporary focus because had D-Day not succeeded, there can be very little doubt that the world we have inherited would have been very different indeed, and for that, we should all be grateful. From Normandy, 50 years on, a very good night. <laughs>